Nuclear weapons, threats of annihilation, and volatile leaders. Are the US and North Korea on the road to war? An upfront special. Fire and fury like the world has never seen. That was Donald Trump's promise should North Korea issue any more threats towards the United States. Yet this week, Kim Jong-un's government threatened the U.S. with the greatest pain and suffering it has ever gone through in its entire history if the U.N. imposed new sanctions, which the U.N. did on Monday night. The toughest ever sanctions on North Korea approved unanimously by the Security Council. So how close are we to all-out nuclear war? Or is there a viable diplomatic solution to this crisis? To debate this, I'm joined in the studio by Robert Gallucci, a former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State who served as the chief U.S. negotiator during the last major crisis with North Korea in 1994, and by Sumi Terry, a former CIA and U.S. National Security Council analyst on North Korea, from Seoul by Yun Young Kwan, former South Korean foreign minister, and from Beijing by Charles Liu, a senior fellow at the Peking University Center on China and Global Affairs and the founder of How Capital. Thank you all for joining me on this special edition of Upfront. Uh, Robert Gallucci, let me start with you. There's been escalating uh, rhetoric from both sides, missile tests, joint exercises, UN votes. It all seems to be kicking off. But how close do you think we actually are to all-out war, uh, to an armed conflict between the United States and allies and the, and the DPRK, North Korea? What I want to say is that we're not close at all. But then, of course, I don't know. Mm. And I think it's hard for anybody to know when you have leaders in the two countries, uh, Kim Jong-un and President Trump, who are relatively new to this deterrence game, and I don't mean that flipply, but the, the dynamic of that interaction, you refer to some of their, their comments. So yes, we could have a situation in which there's an escalation. The North could do what it threatened to do, which is splash down some missiles around Guam. Uh, I don't think the rhetoric itself will cause an escalation to war. I'm fairly confident of that. But I think a miscalculation mm. is plausible, and now we are dealing not only with the possibility of nuclear war, which I think is relatively remote, but the possibility of a major conventional military okay. engagement. So on the, on, the, on the conventional point, Yun Young Kwan, you're in Seoul, your country's capital, has a population of nearly 10 million, less than 60 kilometers from the border with North Korea. Even a conventional non-nuclear war would have catastrophic consequences for your country, for your city. Tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands dead. How worried are people in South Korea right now? How worried are you about the prospect for war? I'm very much concerned and worried about the current situation because I think the current situation is somewhat serious because quite often wars broke out uh, due to misperception, misjudgment, and overreaction. So I think this is a kind of a dangerous situation. And nowadays, more and more uh, South Koreans are uh, uh, feeling the uh, danger uh, uh, than before and uh, uh, they are pretty much concerned. Are South Koreans more worried about what Donald Trump will do or what Kim Jong-un would do? I think we are concerned about North Korean rhetoric. I mean, the, they are the only country which uh, says and threatens uh, the United States. And it's a kind of uh, violation of so-called uh, a sort of uh, code of conduct among uh, nuclear powers. And this kind of behavior is very dangerous, okay. and this will make American policymakers as well as Korean policymakers uh, very much concerned and worried. Uh, Charles Lee, what's the mood in China? Is, is, are people in the West getting unduly upset, concerned, hysterical, or is there, is there a real danger of war in, in that part of the world? I, I go back to your previous question. Um, I think one has to think also about uh, the fact that uh, uh, a certain American president some years ago declared an axis of evil, um, whether or not that was the beginning of the bad re rhetoric, it, one doesn't know. But as far as China is concerned, um, there is the short term, the medium term, and the long term. And the key to long term strategic 
peacefulness or stability and uh, uh, security for North Asia would depend on whether or not the U.S. and China, covering 80 percent, and 20 percent Russia, come to some understanding of North Asian or Northeast Asian stability. The fundamentals are really great power politics, unfortunately. Whether or not there's war, um, the people in China certainly don't think um, it is imminent. Um, the only issue here is whether or not Korea, Republic of Korea, actually has a say on whether or not there is war whether or not Donald Trump would just decide to do something okay. himself. Uh, let me bring in Sumi Terry. You were in the CIA back in 2002. Charles mentioned the Axis of Evil speech when North Korea was added to Iran and Iraq at a very late stage. Do you think that's where it all went downhill from there, or does it predates 2002? It predates because uh, the North Korean cri nuclear crisis really began in early 1990s. Um, so that's way before President Bush ever uttered the words "axis of evil," hmm. um, but I don't want to necessarily sort of go into the blame game because this is where still we are, where we are, hmm. and where we are is North Korea is close to completing the nuclear program, completing the nuclear, uh, perfecting the nuclear arsenal with two intercontinental ballistic missile tests and now six nuclear tests, and the United States still have very limited options to do something about this. Um, but in terms of excess of evil speech, I don't think it's, it was unfortunate. I'm not happy that President Bush ever uttered those words, but I don't think that's the reason for where we, we are where we are right now today. If you had to put your finger on the number one reason we, we are where we are, what would you say? I say Kim Jong-un is, or North Koreans have, want to build nuclear weapons program, complete it now, uh, because they see nuclear weapons as the ultimate, ultimate way for the regime to survive. Um, and they now are not going to give it up for probably any reason, because again, this, they see having nuclear weapons okay. though as the ultimate uh, so, guarantee for their survival. So I, I do want to have a discussion with you all about kind of what is the solution to this, if there is a solution. But before we get there, I am a journalist, I do like blame games. So <laughs> let me bring in Charles Liu in Beijing. Um, uh, Sumi Terry mentioned earlier when I asked her to pinpoint where, if she had to point the finger at a single factor, person, issue for blame, at Kim Jong-un, which a lot of people would do. Uh, is that a view you share? I, I think the, share, the, the blame really has to be shared. Um, uh, just looking at what President Trump has been saying, or going back to Bush calling axis of evil, the process was actually positive for quite some time until um, I think the Kim family saw what happened to the, the other members of the Axis of Evil. Um, I don't think uh, what happened in Iraq or Libya really lent them much confidence to what potentially could happen to them if the U.S. continued its policy of regime change in countries with countries that they don't like. Let me put your regime point, uh, regime change point to, to Sumi. Every time there's any kind of talk of North Korea giving up its nuclear weapons program, its nukes, et cetera, et cetera. The North Koreans publicly, repeatedly point to Iraq and Libya as examples of what happens to a country if it can't defend itself when the United States wants to change the government. Um, how much do you think, would you acknowledge that US regime change wars in recent years have brought us to this current point? Made, made an already paranoid regime even more paranoid? No, absolutely it is true because now Kim Jong-un and the North Koreans are looking at that. I'm looking at is what happened to Libya and absolutely drew the wrong conclusion. Look, you know, Libya decided to give up nuclear weapons and where is Gaddafi? He's dead. Look what happened to Saddam Hussein in Iraq. I mean, he is dead. So, of course, but I would just argue that North Korea's nuclear program began way before. They started in the 50s, 60s, accelerated in the 70s, 80s, and the crisis began in the 1990s where there was, bef this was before Iraq invasion, before Libya there was before a, anything else. there was a Korean but, War, was no, there not? Yeah, but still, in the 1950s, yeah, no, it is which is also part true. of this no, but narrative. After, North Koreans have their own reason for pursuing nuclear program. It's not only a defensive reason that just started okay. uh, after so me, Libya. Robert, do you agree with that? It's not just a defensive reason. As a matter of fact, I, I, I was going to make that point. Yeah. Sumi was going, going there. We like to say, those of us who favor negotiation, and I'm yeah. the one who's done it and, do, and, and I do favor negotiation as a way of dealing with this well before the use of force. However, as we note that the North Koreans have um, concerns, and one might say reasonable concerns, about the United States using force to change their regime, therefore looking to nuclear weapons as a way to deter the United States, that's a rather happy interpretation of North Korean motivation. The North Koreans also quite hate the U.S. ROK alliance, 
They are very upset at those military exercises we conduct jointly all the time. And they would like to unify that peninsula if it was possible under a North Korean regime. That's not plausible when South Korea is aligned with the United States of America. Mm. Cracking that alliance would have certain special appeal. Mm. So I'm, I'm not saying this is the reason, therefore there can be no normalization, but I am suggesting to you that we be realistic about North Korean motivations and that they uh, include perhaps some thinking about separating Seoul from Washington as well. I, I, I would 100% agree with okay, that. Okay, and yet yeah. given that analysis, let me read to you what James Clapper, Obama's Director of National Intelligence until very recently, uh, the North Koreans are not going to give up their nuclear weapons. It's a non-starter. So given what you're saying about the possibility of an offensive use or, you know, d dominating the peninsula, is containment of a nuclear North Korea now the best bet, living with a nuclear-armed Kim Jong-un, or is that a non-starter too, from the U.S. perspective? That may be the, the key question from an American perspective. Right now, Americans, particularly the leadership at defense, at state, at the NSC, and the president himself, the key question is, will we, the United States, live with the threat of nuclear annihilation in the hands of Kim Jong-un the way we have lived with the Soviet threat, the Russian threat, and, the Chinese and threat? And, and my view is that when the option is only the use of force, which can lead to a second Korean War, we ought to think about just shoring up deterrence and going with containment. But I hasten to add, we have not exhausted a negotiated route, and I do not share uh, General Clapper's view that we can forget about a non-nuclear Korean peninsula. I do believe in the long term, normalization is possible. You, you believe that's still possible for North Korea to give up those nuclear weapons? I do. Sumi, do you agree with that? I think it's highly unlikely that they will give up nuclear weapons. Okay, let me, let's, I, go, let's go to Seoul. Yeah. Let me if ask, you, could South Korea live with a nuclear armed Kim Jong-un? Uh, no, we cannot tolerate that. Uh, it is important uh, to, to recognize that we have not exhausted the diplomatic means. What I'm saying is, we have not yet fully implemented uh, a sanction, I mean, a complete sanction against North Korea so that Kim Jong-un change his calculation of cost and benefit of uh, nuclear option. Uh, the reason for that uh, uh, is that there was no international, close international coordination uh, I mean, uh, in applying sanctions against North Korea. For example, U.S. Uh, put uh, first priority on denuclear, de denuclearization, but China put first priority on regime stability of North Korea rather than denuclearization. So there was no close coordination yet. Okay. So how to achieve a much closer coordination from now on? That is the key point, I think. Charles, we're discussing uh, whether North Korea would ever no, give up its absolutely. nuclear weapons. And let me ask you this. A lot of people say they'll never give it up unless China is the one that makes them give it up. Is that fair? Let's, let's, let's go back to what uh, the former foreign minister had, the minister had just said. Uh, he's absolutely right. China looks at the stability of the regime as much more important than denuclearization. Uh, the stability of the regime, if you talk about a regime change, if you continue to press for further sanctions, if you start taking fuel out and food stuff out, you're looking at regime collapse. Is that something we want to see? 20 million well doct indoctrinated people with one and a half million in the armed forces, well weaponized, started crossing the border, both South Korea and China. You tell me the one thing you'd like the US to do right now, and then I'll ask our, our two at US least, reps here um, what they think China should do. I think at least, as China has been saying all along, engage, 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 and not pour more fuel on the fire. Okay. Uh, fire and fury, you know? Indeed. We need, do do Sumi, we need that right now? Sumi, what should China be doing? He, we heard from Charles what he yes, thinks the U.S. I, should I be doing. I understand what he was saying about China's interest and priority, and China wants to avoid instability and regime collapse in North Korea. But China needs to see that we do not have much time left. 
And does it really, does China really want nuclear North Korea? What does that mean? That means possibly nuclear arms race in the Northeast Asian region with South Korea possibly going nuclear, Japan following. There's potential nuclear proliferation. Now we're very close to conflict more than ever before. I still think it's unlikely, but we are there. China's, South Korea, China is number one trading partner for South Korea. The trade mm -hmm. volume between China and South Korea is double okay. that of South Korea, US, South Korea, Japan combined. China needs to have, I think, a diff, they need to just sort of understand that there's interest and priority of just supporting North Korea, giving blank check to North Korea has not worked. And we're not at the close to the end game here. And I think China needs to reevaluate. But, 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 but hold on. You said earlier about, you know, the regime change wars being a problem. And Charles has talked about the need to engage, engage. Uh, you said last week in an interview, I'm all for information warfare. We need to help the people of North Korea rise up. That's the long term game. The North Korean people bring about the change we need. You can't really engage with North Korea if you're also encouraging well, regime I mean, change. I, I'm, not the, I'm not a promoter of engagement dialogue, okay. only because I feel but Are you that a promoter of regime don't... change? Do you think that well, helps no, in the current not crisis? in terms of United States States doing decapitation of regime. But supporting by force, the people rise up. But supporting people of North Korea because the only the long term game here is that we need a different regime to bring about non nuclear North Korea because Kim Jong un is built on completing the program and the only way to do that is to help okay. people of North Korea bring about the change. Do you agree with that, Robert? Uh, no, I, I don't think I do quite the way Sumi has just laid it out. Um, I do think, as I've said a couple of times, that uh, there are possibilities for making movement with negotiations. I certainly do believe and like to accept your invitation to note to my colleague in, in China that the Chinese position has been, for me, a tad conservative. Given what he has said and we understand to be Chinese interests in the continuation of that regime, uh, we do not know, I do not know, whether the next thing that happens will be a North Korean provocation and an American response which will bring American military and naval assets to the doorstep of China. That cannot be what the Chinese want next. And I would suggest that they should think about taking some risks in the direction of increased pressure. At the end of the day, though, I don't know that China will do that. And I think we still need to answer the question, will the United States and should the United States tolerate for now the continued fielding of this capability to strike the United States with an ICBM which the Americans cannot shoot okay. down. Charles, briefly, do you want to respond to that? Ro yes, I, Robert, um, I support your discussions, about, uh, your, your comments about engagement. Absolutely, there is still a chance. But I have to say, in China's case, bringing more American weapons or ships and planes to Chinese waters or Chinese border is not, nothing new for China. 13th Fleet has been there for a long, long time. China has been surrounded by the first island chain. I don't think it makes much difference if you bring a couple more nuclear carriers over. The key for China is stability. Stability so countries in the region can grow. As for Sumi's discussion about, oh, China must do more and that there will be a nuclear arms race, it comes back to my point. Whether or not there will be a nuclear arms race in North Asia will also depend on whether or not the U U.S. wants okay. that to happen. On that note, Charles, so on that note, China let me... and the U.S. Okay, mm -hmm. on that note, let me ask Young Kwan in, in Seoul. I think the uh, defense minister in South Korea uh, recently said the U.S. should perhaps review its decision on whether or not to deploy tactical nuclear weapons to South Korea. Is that something you support? Many would say that that would be just ratcheting up the conflict to the next level. Uh, I think we, South Korean government uh, and people, have to consider that option as well as uh, nuclear de development of ourselves. Uh, uh, because uh, I mean, uh, if we admit, I mean, accept uh, North Korea as a nuclear power, there should be serious imbalance, a military security imbalance between the North and South. And South Koreans will feel threatened, and that naturally lead to their consideration of nuclear option or redeploying uh, tactical nuclear weapons. I think China had better think about whether that kind of nuclear proliferation in this region will be beneficial uh, for their own long-term security interest. I think, uh, I think uh, China will suffer from that kind of new situation caused by uh, North Korean nuclearization. Well, let me just throw this in. China has been used to having both India and Pakistan, who are not very friendly 
with nuclear okay. weapons let me ask on its a, borders. Let, let me ask a question before we run out of time. I do want to ask you all a question, which I'm sure many viewers at home will be asking, which is Kim Jong-un himself. Here is a young leader in his 30s. He's never met with a foreign leader. He now has potential to attack the United States with <laughs> nuclear weapons. Is he irrational? Is he crazy? Is he suicidal? This is a question that's often asked. Uh, let me ask all of you your take on the leader himself. Robert. I don't have any reason to believe he's suicidal. I believe he could do the basic calculations necessary for deterrence. That's why I think we can depend upon deterrence as we have in Europe and as we have in Asia for a long time. It's not something that I want to translate into acceptance of the North Korean nuclear weapons program because I quite agree. If we do that, then we do do something to our extended deterrence to the South Koreans and to the Japanese and encourage them in a the direction of nuclear weapons acquisition. But with respect to Kim Jong-un, I think that deterrence will work. Uh, Young Kwon? I think we need to assume that Kim Jong-un is not suicidal and Kim Jong-un cares uh, much about his own survival as well as his regime's survival. I, th I think under that assumption, I think we need to send a clear signal to North Korea. Uh, for example, what we want is policy change, not regime change or a preventive war. So I think we need to uh, send a clear signal consistently that we need policy change. And if they change uh, their policy, we will provide uh, some uh, security guarantee or, uh, I mean, uh, re regime stability. We will help them a lot. I think that's the assumption on which our engagement, South Korea's engagement policy has been based on. Charles, you visited North Korea, I believe. I mean, how does the reality yes. of North Korean society and the way they treat their leader and, the, you know, allegations of brainwashing match with what, what your experiences were on the ground? I, I think uh, much of the propaganda that we see coming out of Korea is really for domestic consumption. I think it's to maintain, of course, the nuclear deterrence is to maintain the regime and himself and his family and his cohorts. But the other part is really for domestic consumption. There has been significant transformation. I wouldn't say transformation yet but uh, changes in, in North Korea, uh, the situation seems to have improved. Um, and there seems to be much more interest in the basic economic livelihood of the population. This, so it's a carrot but, and but stick. Charles, you you, Charles just to take Robert's point, livelihood. do you believe deterrence can work mm -hmm. between a nuclear-armed North Korea and a nuclear-armed United States under Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump, by the way? Uh, I, I wouldn't say... Uh, Donald Trump is a very good example of what the American presidency's strategic vision is. But uh, uh, as far as the North Korean side, I think nuclear deterrence certainly will work, okay. especially if it's guaranteed by the U.S., China, and Russia. Okay. Sumi, I mean, I asked a question to the other three guests about uh, Kim Jong-un's rationality. Let me ask you about his and Donald Trump's rationality. You've worked in the CIA and the National Security Council. If you were in government right now, you'd be trying to give advice to President Trump, a former property developer and reality TV star, about perhaps the world's biggest crisis. How would you feel about that? Well, would that I fill would, you with confidence? Uh, yeah, no, no, yeah, no, it doesn't. But I, I, I would echo what everybody said. I do think that Kim Jong-un is ruthless. Uh, actually, he's more ruthless than even his father, just to see, you know, when mm. we look at how he assassinated in Chang song his uncle and his half-brother. But uh, he's ruthless, and but he's not suicidal. I don't think they're ideological. He's about all about region preservation. So I do think ultimately deterrence and containment could work with nuclear North Korea. But I just want to point out the problem with that, there's one problem with that, is because it's not just about survival. North Korea's long-term goal is to get US forces out of the Korean Peninsula and then to be able to, so I'm worried about nuclear blackmail uh, in terms of living with nuclear North Korea. And I'm gonna give last word to Robert Gallucci, Trump and Kim. Both of the, you know, Trump talked about getting in a room with Kim, meeting with Kim. Do you think that's ever going to happen? Trump and Kim, what could possibly go wrong? Uh, it, it seems to me that uh, we are in a very dangerous situation, in, in, as Sumi has said, and we are for, in large part because of the leadership in both countries. 
uh, and I, I, I'm including my own. I, uh, the, the president has been volatile on any number of issues, including this one, and I would like that tone to go down. It's, we have a huge discount factor that you apply and I apply to everything that comes out of Pyongyang. We shouldn't have that with what comes out of Washington. And on that note, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you all for joining me on this special edition of Upfront. That's our show. Upfront will be back next week.